Hi, my name is Dr. Dina Fur, and I'm going to do a test review for the assessment class. Uh, we're looking at the first exam. I've been a nurse for about, well, I hate to say how many years, uh, and found nursing school very challenging, as you probably are. And I have two sons that are also nurses. And so as they went through nursing school, I got to hear what it was like from their standpoint. And after their first exam, they came home saying, wow, um, tests in nursing school are just different from other tests because they give you a multiple choice question and all four distractors, all four answers are correct. One of them is just more correct than the others. And there's quite a learning curve. I, I think they're right. Now what I want to do with you is go over ways to be successful in nursing exams and then we're going to go over assessment questions for this exam. Now these are not real test questions. I'm not allowed to use questions from the real exam, but I've chosen some from most of the topic areas that you're going to be covering on the first exam and I've chosen a variety of formats. Multiple choice, select all that apply, uh, sequencing questions so that you can get an idea of how to answer those for this current class. So I hope you enjoy the, the little cartoons I've inserted. Uh, here's some important information. To be successful, you do need to eat well. Get enough sleep, especially the night before the exam. Some students want to cram the day before. Or, or even the day of. Turns out that's not the most effective way. Review. Review a couple of small items, uh, but you want to do most of your hard study way before. Start five to seven days before an exam. Set up what day you're going to cover which material, and then um, follow your plan. Is there something you're not understanding? Be sure and ask early. <clears throat> Best test taking strategies that I can give you don't actually replace all the reading, studying, and understanding of the material that you're going to need to do. Set up a schedule to study every single day. That's what you want to do. Every single day you want to spend some time studying, even if it's just five minutes before you go to bed because you've been working a 12-hour shift. Turns out if you actually study those things every day, again, even if it's five minutes, it's going to stay in your head better than if you take all those five minutes and then study right before the exam. Revise your schedule as needed. Don't be hard on yourself if you don't do exactly what you'd planned to do. Just pick up the pieces and go, okay, now I'm going to try it. It helps if you've reviewed information several times before a test. Here's another trick. Um, when you've studied an inf information for the first time, try to review it within five or six hours or at least sometime the same day. Again, even if it's just five minutes, it'll stay in your head better uh, if, you, if you review it uh, frequently or okay, moving on. Here's some effective strategies for answering nursing questions. As you've already figured out, it's not a pencil and paper test. You actually have to answer test questions in the same way they will be on the NCLEX to where you get one question. You have to answer it. You go on and you don't get to go back. So here's one effective strategy. Actually take a piece of paper and cover the answer options. Read the question read every single word, identify the, the key concepts and the topic of the question, ask yourself what is this question really asking, make sure again you're hitting the key words, and then try to answer the question before you look at the answers. This will help you to zero in on the one topic. Now, uncover the answer choices, read every word again, eliminate the ones you know you're, that are wrong, probably there's at least one you can identify right off the bat, and then go back and look at the questions. Don't what if, don't add or take away, choose your answer, 
and then commit to it. Don't change it unless you realized you have misread the question in some way. Okay, there's a couple of books that will be really helpful to you. Uh, the Saunders Comprehensive NCLEX Review is, is the best NCLEX review out there. If you use that, you're going to be well prepared for nursing questions. And you know, every single test that you take in nursing school is ultimately preparing you for the NCLEX. That's what the lead teachers have in mind when they design their questions. Uh, you could also get the strategies for test success that talks about the various different kinds of questions and how to prepare. Uh, both of those are excellent resources. A couple of, of uh, questions that really give nursing students a hard time are the priority questions. Um, which of the things should you do first? What should your initial reaction be? What is the best way to proceed? As you see those key words, think of different things. I, as an experienced nurse, and some of you are already experienced nurses, it's so tempting to say, what do you mean what's the best answer or what would you do first? I'd do all of them and I'd do all of them at the same time. But you can't, you can't answer a test question that way. They actually want you to select which one would be first. Think of your ABCs, your airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, if that doesn't help, think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you may need to go through the nursing process. Usually you're going to want to assess first. And when you're done, review the rationales after the test because that's going to help you. It's going to help you because everything's fresh in your mind. It'll help you for the next test. Why did you miss each question you missed? Did you misread? Did you actually not know that information that, that the question was about? Or did you change your answer? And ask yourself, how can I do it better next time? Because you can and you will. Finally, again, study daily, even if it's just a short period. Review the material more than once. As you're studying, study the hardest stuff first. It's real tempting for nursing students to study what they already know. But that's a waste of your time, so resist that urge. Do practice questions after you've studied the content. Get out, oh, maybe your ATI practice um, test or the Saunders review that I just noted, and review the questions after you've study the content, you'll have to go back and say, oh wow, I don't remember that exactly. And so it will be very effective studying. And also, don't say, oh you idiot, how come you got that wrong? Use positive self-talk. I'm really good at this, I just don't remember that particular thing. The positive self-talk turns out to be more important than many people realize. And remember this, you're not alone. If you're having a challenge, if you're having a hard time with tests, make an appointment. Uh, go to the student success organization that every nursing student at UTA is a part of. Make an appointment uh, to talk to those of us in student success. Or you can contact the lead teacher, ask your clinical instructor, or the peer mentor. You're not the first one to have gone through this and felt a little discouraged about the difficulty of the questions. But guess what? Most of our students make it through and some of them have been in this exact same situation that you have uh, at your lowest point, and we can help you get through this. So let's start our practice questions for the first uh, exam. These were composed by Deanne Scheidler and Dina Furr. Here is a list of the exam contents that you're going to be needing to master for the first exam. So we will do some practice questions in most of these areas. And here's how the re review will work. We're going to do just as I recommended uh, that you should do. For the selected questions, we're just going to start with the STEM. In the next slide, we're going to highlight the important items. In the next slide, we'll answer a question, and then in the final slide for that question, we'll discuss the rationale. That means that each question we review will have about four slides. So don't panic if you see, oh my goodness, there's over 100 slides. We go through them quite quickly. So here's our first question. 
The nurse de uh, demonstrates the purpose of a health history by documenting which information about a client's respiratory system. So let's analyze here. What are the key terms? The nurse demonstrates the purpose of a health history. So despite what other distractors you see, the right answer needs to refer to the purpose of the health history uh, regarding the respiratory system. Now let's look at our distractors. Okay, perception of his or her respiratory health status, tactile fremitus and breath sounds, vital signs including respiratory rate and oxygen saturation, respiratory excursion and respiratory effort. At first glance, you might say, well, they're all right. They all do relate to the respiratory system, but look at what the stem says, which demonstrates the purpose of what? The health history. That means it's not going to be objective data. It's going to be subjective data. Which one of these is dealing with subjective data? That's objective. Vital signs are objective. Tactile fremitus and breath sounds are objective. Perception would be subjective from the patient's point of view. So the correct answer is going to be one. Indeed, that's what the correct answer is. And we got that by noticing uh, what the terms are. The purpose of the health history is to document the client's perceptions of his or her health, which is subjective data. Tactile fremitus and, and breath sounds, vital signs, respiratory excursion, all of those are objective data. Those come in the physical examination, the head-to-toe examination of the client. Moving on. When obtaining information about a child's health history, the nurse would include which data? Select all that apply. So note that there's, there really is going to be more than one correct answer for this upcoming question. And let's just imagine what some of the things might be. Now this is still a health history, so it's going to be subjective information. And also when I see child, I think, hmm, we're probably going to be getting some of this from the parent. Uh, so let's move on and see what our options are. Past medical history, present medical complaint, review of systems, general survey, and vital signs. Okay, this is a health history. Right now, we can rule out vital signs because that is objective data. The general survey, as you look through the book, what that term means, also happens to be objective data. So, um, as we're looking at the health history, past medical history would be subjective data. Present medical complaint, that would be why are you here today, or why is your child here today? And a review of systems, that's also a review of the health history in all of the systems of the body, neuro, respiratory, etc. So I'm thinking we could select the first three of those, and indeed that's correct. Past medical history, etc. Rationale, the components of a health history include past and present medical history, all those are subjective, whereas general survey and vital signs are objective data. Here's another question. Which of these statements represents subjective data uh, which the nurse obtains from the patient regarding the patient's skin? I'm continuing to stress this because you will find some test questions on your test uh, requiring you to know the difference between subjective and objective data. Which of these statements represents subjective data? Skin appears dry, no obvious lesions, denies color change, or a lesion noted in the lateral aspect of the arm. All of these relate to the patient's skin. Only one is subjective data. And that's what the patient has to say about it. The patient denies color change. That is the correct answer. Here's why. Moving on, a client is admitted for evaluation of upper 
GI or gastrointestinal symptoms, the nurse would document which statement is objective data in the client's medical record. That's the stem. What are the key points? Gastrointestinal systems, and it does have to be objective data. Well, here's a big clue. The ones that say client states are all going to be subjective data. The client has distended abdomen and active bowel sounds. That is indeed the correct answer because that's not something that the patient has said in this situation. It's something you observed for yourself. Objective data is information the nurse can directly obtain and verify. You can measure it, you can inspect it, you can auscultate it. You can't observe a headache, nausea, or a history of chickenpox. Subjective data is obtained during the review of systems. The aspect of the health history in which the nurse verbally gathers information from the client. Okay, here's a sequencing question. These are a little more complicated. The clinic nurse is conducting a health history. Place in proper sequence the questions the nurse would ask using the standard format for collecting health history information. All options must be used. All of these are right. You have to put them in the correct order. Does anyone in your family have diabetes mellitus? For what reason did you come to the clinic today? What is your date of birth? Can you tell me about your support systems and have you ever been hospitalized? So here is the correct order. We're going to start with demographics. What is your date of birth? The next thing you want to find out is why they're here. For what reason did you come to the clinic today? Now you're going to start the history. Have you ever been hospitalized? Now you're going to family health history and now you're getting into support systems. So date of birth again is demographic. Why the client came is the chief complaint. And this is one of the first things to get in the, in the health history. Assessment or prior hospitalizations is part of the health history gathered third, then a family history, and then the sixth category, we're starting the review of systems. And that's why we asked about support. Okay, another question. The nurse is nearing the end of an interview. Which statement is appropriate at this time? What are you going to say is your ending? Okay, end of an interview, what's appropriate? Did we forget something? Well, that's a little condescending. Is there anything else you would like to mention? I need to go check on the next patient. I'll be back. While I'm here, let's talk about your upcoming surgery. So this is the end of an interview, remember. What is right? Did we forget something again? No, we don't like to talk to the patient in the plural. Is there anything else you would like to mention that gives the patient an opportunity to mention whatever they think is important? Let's go on and find out. Um, the question gives the person a final opportunity for self-expression. No new topic should be introduced and the other uh, responses are not really appropriate. 75-year-old woman is at the office for a pre-operative interview. The nurse is aware that the interview may take longer than interviews with younger patients. What is the reason for this? Hmm, you might say, what could, what could be the answer? Try to come up with something before you look. Here are the key terms. An older person, 75 years. Why is it going to take longer? Longer story to tell. They're usually lonely and want someone to talk to. Aged persons lose their mental abilities and require greater time. As a person ages, they can't hear as well. So they, you may have to repeat some of the things that you've said. Those are your options. Let's talk about the correct answer here. It's because an aged person has a longer story to tell. 
why is that? There's more history to gather. Your health history is going to be longer because they've had more things help them. These other things might or might not be true, but you can't make the assumption that they are. Some aged persons aren't actually lonely. They've got a lot of things going on. And so if you selected that, you would have been reading something in. Same thing with this one. Uh, they lose their mental abilities. Oh, yeah, you don't have to go very long before you know that 75-year-olds, many of them are very sharp. As a person ages, they can't hear. Again, that's making an assumption. That's adding to what is in there. You're, you're reading in information, we would say. Again, the rationale is that there's just more history. All of these other things may not be true. One more question for the health history. When observing a patient's verbal and nonverbal communication, the nurse notices a discrepancy. They're not agreeing. Which statement is true regarding this situation? The nurse should. Let's, let's note the important. Observing verbal and nonverbal. There's a discrepancy, and which statement is true? So what are our options? Ask someone who knows the patient well to help interpret this discrepancy. Focus on the patient's verbal message and ignore the nonverbal. I bet you can eliminate that one right now. Try to integrate the verbal and nonverbal and kind of average them out, interpret them as an average. Focus on the patient's nonverbal behaviors because these are often more reflective of a person's true feelings. That is actually the correct answer. Why would you not want to do these? Well, um, do we really need to ask somebody else what the patient's thinking? Definitely don't want to ignore any part. You don't want to average them. But focus is the term here. You want to focus on which one will be reflective. You might see this if somebody says, no, 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 I'm not hurting. I don't need anything for pain. But you look at them and they look like they are hurting. That's just some data that you can focus on. Uh, you're still going to do what the patient wants in that situation. If they don't want pain medication, you're not going to give it. But you'll, you'll focus on that and keep it in mind as the day wears on and you care for that patient. That is some information that you would come back to. When verbal and nonverbal messages are congruent, the verbal message is reinforced. That means that you have some extra data for it. But when they're incongruent, many times the nonverbal message is the true one because it's under less conscious control. So watch your patients. Uh, look at their verbal, nonverbal uh, information and try to understand the meaning. It may take some time. Okay, now we're going to start questions on the physical examination. Prior to beginning a physical examination of a client, the nurse would carry out which activities? Select all that apply. Here's the rationale on these. You can treat each one of these as a true or false to help you select all that apply. Let's look at the keywords. Prior to beginning a physical examination, the nurse would carry out which activities? Okay, before you start, wash hands. Is that a true or false? Yeah, you would definitely wash hands. I'm voting for this one. Provide privacy. What do you think about that? Obtain the healthcare provider's order. Explain the procedure. Position the patient comfortably. Have you selected your choices? Let's see what's right. here. Washing hands is always going to be correct, isn't it? Prior to beginning, wash hands. Provide for the privacy of the patient. So again, if we were to, to see each of these as true and false, that would be true, that would be true. Number three is actually false. Why? You don't have to have a doctor's order to assess a patient. Assessing a patient is within the nurse's scope of practice. There does not need to be any kind of an order for you to be able to do that. So um, you don't have to get an order first. Explain the procedure. Absolutely, that's a true. And then position the client comfortably. Absolutely, that's true. Okay, 
This says exactly the same thing that we said. Again, you don't have to have an order to carry out an assessment. Okay, select all that apply. Let's move on. So we will select all that apply for palpating. Have you got in your mind what you think the right answers are? Let's take a look. True and false. Temperature, true. Texture, true. Can you feel pigment? If it's just pigmented and there's no raised lesion, you can't feel that. You can see it, but you can't feel it. So that would be a false. Moisture, you can feel. You can palpate moisture. You can palpate elasticity with your, with your fingers as you assess the patient. So you would palpate the skin for temperature, which should be warm. Texture could be smooth. Palpation can uh, assess for moisture, elasticity, but you can assess pigment. To determine the quality and intensity of a cardiac murmur, the nurse would take which action? Again, the key points would be quality, intensity of the murmur, and you're going to have to do something here. Use a Doppler, use the bell of your stethoscope, percuss the thorax cavity, palpate the chest wall, which is correct. Try to figure out which one you think it's going to be. And the correct answer is number two, use the bell. <clears throat> You're trying to listen to a heart murmur here. Doppler is not going to help you. Percussing isn't going to help you. Palpating isn't going to help you. You're going to have to use the bell of your stethoscope. Why? To listen to low frequency sounds, you would use the bell. Murmurs are usually low pitched. In contrast, the diaphragm of the stethoscope is used to elicit high pitched sounds. A Doppler is used to assess peripheral pulses that are not palpable, so you wouldn't use a Doppler. And of course, percussion won't provide information on sounds, high or low pitched heart sounds, and you can't palpate a sound, can you? Physical examination continuing here. In an effort to provide a comfortable environment for a patient during a physical assessment, you would take which action? Again, the key words are going to be uh, in, a, in an effort to provide a comfortable environment for a physical assessment. Drape the client prior to beginning the examination. Urge the client to have all abnormal findings treated properly. Avoid wearing gloves so the client won't feel as though the nurse doesn't wish to touch their skin or obtain a, a signed consent to perform the physical assessment. Have you selected your answer? The correct answer is drape the client before beginning the exam. Again, think about providing a comfortable environment for a physical assessment. Which answer is right? Rationale. Properly draping a client will help keep them warm. Um, don't want them to freeze. Um, while clients should seek treatment for abnormal findings, this doesn't answer the right question. It's not part of providing a comfortable environment. When coming in contact with the fluid, you are actually going to need to wear gloves, and you don't have to have a signed consent for a physical assessment. Validating and documenting data. A 59-year-old patient tells the nurse that he has ulcerative colitis. He has been having, quote, black stools for the last 24 hours. How would the nurse best document his reason for seeking care? Note that the patient tells the nurse that he has ulcerative colitis. He knows his own diagnosis. He knows his symptoms. Those are in quotation marks for the last 24 hours. How would the nurse document this? JM is a 59-year-old male patient here for ul ulcerative colitis. Uh, JM came to the clinic complaining of black stools for the last 24 hours. 59-year-old male states he has ulcerative colitis and wants it checked. JM is a 59-year-old male here for having black stools for the last 24 hours. Have you selected the correct answer? Let's move on. And it is the final one. 
Let's talk about why that's the best answer. All of these are true, aren't they? But one of them's the better answer. And why is this the better answer? That's what the rationale is going to tell you. The reason for seeking care is a brief, spontaneous statement in the patient's own words that describe the reason for the visit. It states one or two signs or symptoms in their duration. The best answer has has those signs and symptoms enclosed in quotation marks to indicate the patient's direct uh, words, exact words. The CAGE test is a screening questionnaire that helps to identify. So what does it help to identify? For this question, you need to have read the book and know what the CAGE test is, C-A-G-E. So what are your options? It's a screening questionnaire that helps to identify which unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, personal response to stress, excessive or uncontrollable drinking, or depression. Again, you're going to have to do some reading to do this. I chose this question because there's a good chance it will actually be on your test because it is in the uh, Weber and Kelly book that you're using. And the answer is excessive or uncontrollable drinking. That's what the CAGE questionnaire assesses because CAGE is a screening, it's a mnemonic device. Uh, the C stands for cut down. Are you annoyed when someone asks you about it? Do you feel guilty? Do you drink as an eye opener? So that's what the CAGE stands for. Moving on, the nurse is assessing orientation in a 79 year old patient. Which of these responses would be the best for a nurse? the nurse to conclude that this patient is oriented. 79 year old patient. Which would be best to conclude that the patient is oriented? So each one of these is the patient speaking. I know my name is John. I couldn't tell you where I am. I do think it's 2018 though. Well there's some orientation. There's person and there's year isn't there? The person doesn't say that they know where they are, though. They're not oriented to place. I know that my name is John, but to tell you the truth, I get kind of confused about the date. So here we know that this patient is oriented to only person or self. I know that my name is John. I guess I'm at the hospital in Arlington. No, I don't know the date. Sometimes patients will say that. Well, when you wake up, do you actually know the date? Uh, probably most of us don't right off the bat. So this isn't necessarily bad, but we would like to get more information. Even if the person doesn't know the date, if they can give us something, that helps. I know that my name is John. I'm at the hospital in Arlington. I couldn't tell you what the date is, but I know that it's September 2018. Okay. Have you selected your answer? And that's right. It is the final, final one. Uh, many aging persons experience isolation, loss of structure without a job. They aren't going into work every day. They don't always remember the exact date. Uh, Short-term memory loss is actually pretty common. And these are going to affect uh, orientation. The person may not provide the precise date or complete name of the agency. But you can consider an aging person oriented if they know generally where they are and generally what the time is. Orientation to place is accepted with the correct identification of the type of setting, i.e. hospital, and the name of the town. Item D is best. Assessing mental status. The nurse is performing a mental status examination. Which statement is true regarding assessment of the mental status? True. Which statement is true? And this is a mental status question. Mental status assessment diagnoses specific psychiatric orders, mental disorders occur in response to everyday life stressors, mental status functioning is inferred through assessment of an individual's behavior, mental status can be assessed directly just like other systems of the body. Which of those seems right to you? Okay, the correct answer, mental status functioning is inferred through assessment of an individual's behaviors. Why? 
Can you actually directly see mental status like you can cardiac? Can you hear it? No. So this answer is incorrect. Mental disorders occur in response to everyday life stressors. Well, not for the average person. Mental status assessment diagnosis specific psychiatric orders. It actually won't. Uh, it's a screen. It's an assessment, not a diagnostic tool. So a healthy mental status is needed to think clearly and function in all areas. It's reflected in one's appearance, behavior, speech, thought patterns. One's mental health may vary from day to day depending on a variety of factors. Assessment of mental health is inferred. Be alert for all verbal and behavioral clues that reflect the client's medical status from the very first interaction that you have. General status and vital signs, moving on. Patients' weekly blood pressure readings for two months have ranged between 124 over 84 and 136 over 88, with an average reading of 126 over 86. The nurse knows that this blood pressure falls within which blood pressure category. So is this hypertension? Is it not? Here's our choices. Normal blood pressure, borderline, stage 1, or stage 2 hypertension. So our average reading is 126 over 86. Can you imagine which one might be correct? The correct answer is borderline. I put the rationale here. This is something that you'll need to take a look at. Um, so the definitions have changed from previous editions from the books. We used to diagnose borderline as pre-hypertension. And now we're calling it borderline. When assessing an older adult, the nurse keeps in mind that which sign changes occur with aging. So which are the important ones? We don't have to read them out here. An older adult. Which vital sign changes occur with aging? Increase in pulse rate, widened pulse pressure. What's pulse pressure? The difference between systolic and diastolic. Increase in body temperature, decrease in diastolic pressure. The correct answer is widened pulse pressure. Why? Widening of the pulse pressure is seen with aging due to less elastic peripheral arteries. There's no difference in normal pulse rate for older adults. Uh, research has shown that for older adults, body temperature for all routes is actually lower than in younger people. Older adults may have more rigid atherosclerotic arteries that may actually increase their blood pressure. Now let's move on to pain assessment. The nurse needs to remember when assessing pain, the lack of expression does not always equate with the pain being experienced. Pain medication can, be, can significantly increase a patient's pain tolerance. The majority of cultures value the concept of suffering in silence. Most people experience approximately the same pain tolerance. I bet you can eliminate at least two of those right now. The correct answer is one. The lack of expression does not always equate with the pain being experienced. And I might also add, some patients will moan and groan and even cry out in pain. Does the person that's crying out in pain have more pain than the patient in the next bed who's just maybe squinching up their eyes or having other nonverbal signs? The answer is you can't always go by, um, by what people are are but the sounds they make are the expressions that they have. So that's the best answer. The rationale is an obvious response to pain is not always apparent because sociocultural factors dictate, may dictate behavior. Fear of treatment for pain, lack of validation, acceptance of pain as punishment, uh, the need to be strong and courageous and non-complaining are factors that influence individual responses for pain. The opposite may be true for the second option. Many ethnic groups are able to express their pain, making the third option untrue. The fourth isn't accurate because pain tolerance varies widely among people and is influenced by experiences, psychological issues, sociocultural factors. 
continuing in pain assessment, the nurse is assessing a patient's headache pain. Which questions reflect one or more of the critical characteristics of symptoms that should be assessed? Select all that apply. So we know we're going to select more than one option. So we're going to treat each one of these as a true false. We're assessing headache pain, critical characteristics of symptoms. Okay, select all that apply. Where is the pain? Did you have these as a child? On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is the pain? How often do the headaches occur? What makes the headaches better? Do you have any family history of headaches? So remember, think of the cold spa. Which one of these would answer your cold spa? We're looking for critical characteristics of symptoms. So where is the headache? That would be the location. Did you have these as a child? Well, this, is, this would be history and, and not helpful. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it? This would be severity. How, how often do headaches occur? This would be frequency. What makes the headaches feel better? This can be associated factors. This is a history question. So again, using the cold spa techniques is what is going to help you on this sort of question character, onset, location, duration, severity, pattern, and associated. Definitely read this section in your book because you will see it. I can guarantee you'll see it on the upcoming test. The nurse is reviewing principles of pain. Which type of pain is due to an abnormal processing of the pain impulse through the peripheral or central nervous system? What are the key points? This is going to be abnormal processing of pain. So you're going to have to think about the different kinds of pain now. Visceral pain, referred pain, cutaneous pain, and neuropathic. Visceral would be muscular tissue pain. Referred pain means the source is someplace else. The patient's feeling it in a different part of the body. Cutaneous refers to the skin structures. And neuropathic would be because there's a difficulty with the nerves. Neuropathic is the correct answer. So there's a problem. You might think of diabetic neuropathy. Patients having pain in the feet. There's actually nothing wrong with the foot, but the patient perceives pain there because it's neuropathic. Neuro meaning something with the nerve. Pathic means pathologic. There's a problem there. Okay, so you can read the rationale here. The nurse is obtaining a health assessment on a client who reports leg pain and inability to perform activities of daily living. The nurse would ask which questions to obtain information about the client's ability to carry out ADLs. Select all that apply. Leg pain. The client's ability to carry out ADLs or activities of daily living, select all that apply. Can you tell me how pain is affecting your life? Do you know what is causing the problem? Does anyone in your family have these musculoskeletal problems? Can you describe how your activity level has changed? Can you tell me about your hobbies? So ask each one of these as a true fault and what do you get? Only two of them were correct in this situation. Can you tell me how the pain is affecting your life? Well, that's an ADL, activities of daily living. Do you know what's causing the problem? Well, that isn't asking about their ability to carry out ADLs. Does anyone in your family have it? That's a history problem. Can you describe how your activity level has changed? That's ADLs. And tell me about your hobbies. Well, that's not necessarily an ADL. So you can see and I will let you read the rationale yourself here as we move on. Assessing the musculoskeletal system continues. The nurse is examining the spine of a client who is experiencing extreme curvature of the lumbar area. How should the nurse document this finding? The key word, extreme curvature of the lumbar area. So this is a question in which you need to know the terminology. Kyphosis, scoliosis, lordosis, osteoporosis. 
the key thing is going to be lumbar area. So look at that. The correct answer is lordosis. Whereas kyphosis, that's up in the shoulders. Scoliosis is in the mid-back. Lordosis is in the lower back or the lumbar area. And osteoporosis is something different, isn't it? It would be used as a distractor simply because it ends in the same way. Uh, so here again is the rationale for that. And moving on. The nurse assesses the range of motion of an ankle by moving the ankle through which types of movements select all that apply. Plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, know these terms, inversion, eversion, and rotation. This is a, basically all of these. Dor plantar flexion which would be pointing your toe downward, dorsiflexion pointing it upward, inversion and eversion are the other movements, um, not rotation in this case. So go ahead and look at those. If you're not understanding, uh, get your book out and look at the pictures in the book. Uh, it'll help you remember what all of those terms mean. This is one of the advantages of of going through test questions is you see where your weak point is and what terms you need to know. Patient is complaining of pain in his joints that's worse in the morning, is better after he's moved around, and then gets worse if he sits for long periods of time. The nurse should assess for other signs of what problem. So this is a complex question. Let's talk about what you need to know. You're gonna, what can you assess for other signs of what problem. So not only do you need to guess which problem, is you need to think of other signs of it. So this is a very complex question. Tendinitis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, intermittent claudication. So which one, which one of these does the description hold for? And it would be rheumatoid arthritis. So go ahead and check your rationales. And that is the last question. And so um, we will have another exam review for the second exam once that comes up. Thank you for, for listening.